Uh, also, you're just checking recording is okay for room three. I'm assuming so because we're recording. Hi, Wesley. I think we're recording from Andrea's device. All right. Okay. Never mind. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So recording's up. We'll get started with the debate. So uh, general house rules apply. I'm going to time your speeches, but I'm quite terrible at putting them in the chat. So please also time yourselves and also your fellow speakers. Um, please indicate your POI preference at the top of your speech so that there's no miscommunication on the floor. Uh, obviously, POIs are highly encouraged for engagement and good debate purposes. So if there's no further questions, um, I call the Prime Minister to start the debate. Here, here. Hello, can I confirm that I'm audible loud and clear? Yeah, loud and clear. Great, cool. Uh, PEY is through the chat. I'll preferably take closing. Just give me 10 seconds to start. Um, All right, cool. Starting in three, two, one. I think when starting with a political career and you specifically have to make a choice, you want to make a make the, you want to be sure to make a choice that lasts in the long run, as opposed to a choice where you just ended up sidelining your political career and you don't get to choose and you don't get to kind of make the differences that you wanted to make in the first place. I want to first talk about the interests of this actor in this debate. And then we'll decide what should be the calculus decision, what is likely to be the decision that this person is going to take and why that's a better decision we explain from outside of the house. First and foremost, let's talk about the interests of a progressive young Malaysian politician up and coming what their interests are likely to be. When you're a progressive person, you also specifically ex like want progressive policies to come into picture. So you want to have like more progressive policies such as affirmative action, like women's rights, like LGBTQI rights. These are things that you probably want to see more like being talked about in the political sphere in Malaysia. But secondly, you also have interest in terms of wanting to be in a political party, not just like the one that kind of wins by majority, but also you want to be in a political party where you can be in the political party in the wrong long run. It means that you don't just want to settle for like low positions where you can't make a significant amount of change. You want to be in one where you can be an influential person. So we're going to prove to you in this debate why you're more likely to get this influence within a party like Muda as opposed to a party like PH. So the second thing is, like the third thing is also about like you want to in general come about like policies that decrease inequality between rich and poor. And you also want to like probably at some points align with the center left, which is like what currently is happening. Like Muda is going to align with like Pakatan Harapan. So it means that you're going to have some form of alliance. So what you really want to understand in this debate is how this goes forward if you were to choose Muda versus how this would go forward if you were to choose Pakatan Harapan. The thing I want to argue first is that it's probably likely that Pakatan Harapan, since it's been a party that has been established a while long, a while earlier than Muda and is like made up of people that are more older as opposed to like the youth led party in Muda, you're going to have like an established structure in Arki. That is to say that you have people that have been all already established in the power structures. You've already established who is going to take the lead if Pakatan Harapan wins, to who's going to come into power within the next few years. You've already like accumulated resources for the same and you're not probably going to change that. So while you may be able to accommodate some form of difference of opinions, you're probably going to still continue to keep that same power structure, which means someone who's like a young and upcoming politician is less likely even 10 years down the line, likely to come into a power structure within a party like Pakatan Harapan as opposed to in Muda. Why is this the case? Because while Muda probably has lesser amount of resources, they're also a party that was just formed like two years ago. POI. They're also a party that, I'll take you later, they're also a party that was just formed two years ago. But to, what is important to note here is that you're probably still going to start, side up with parties like Makatan Harapan because you're also like a democratic party, which means there's two things that are going to happen here. One, because of the fact that you're a recent party, you don't probably have a very, very established structure of power, which means you haven't probably decided in terms of like who specifically will take power. But the more important thing to note here is what is likely to happen when you sort of join this party and what is going to be the likely outcome of your political career. The point here to note is that even if it has like one major person that started the party, the point is that it's still a young, growing party. 
which then means that your sort of political opinions and as you grow with your influence over the period of years you are probably going to side with the more influential person in muda like muda isn't the party that is like going to succeed maybe in the next five coming years it's probably going to be the one that grows over its influence like increases the kind of influence that it has in the political sphere over a period of years it's like probably two or three terms where it probably grows in its influential power so you probably want to be a you want to be one of those influential people within the start of the party and grow with the influence of the party and grow your political career as the party continues to grow that is far better than being in a party which probably already has established power structures but you're probably going to be sidelined in the party why is that likely to be be the case know that while it's a central left party so while you may still have progressive policies that opposition is going to talk about they still have like not so much of a conflict of issue but know how like central left generally in like in any POI. atmosphere has issues i'll take pos exclusively through the chat please you have specific issues with regards to having political discussions because there's so much like sort of contradictions when you're specifically talking in the center left because a lot of people while they prefer left like economic policies and note that center left doesn't automatically mean progressive and liberal policies it majorly means that you have like economically left policies so yes sure you might have like more social welfare policies you may sure like have more uh, policies in terms of providing more jobs and all these kind of things we are still less likely to have all these kind of progressive policies that you'd want as a specific youth person which are like as like less conservative and all these kind of things the problem then here becomes is that it's a party that's already has an established structure so you so your ability to go ahead and talk about these are the kind of policies you want in place are less likely to happen because you're not the most influential person within that party whereas muda is still a party that's like developing the point to note here is that you probably even within muda you're less likely to have like an issue of resources so even if that's something opposition wants to argue i don't think that's going to happen for two reasons one your access to resources is likely to be shared amongst other parties that you will form a coalition with but secondly it's important to note that all of these resources also come from parties that are probably in like significant in like same picture with you i'll take that view from ceo yeah so muda has already committed to follow ph on most policy outcomes so what change do you actually get in terms of getting more progressive policy i think the change about progressive policies is not specifically that you'll make significant amount of policy change but it's about how further are you in the drive towards those policy change i think i like like just let's just have an intuition pump here right is similar to like probably being the ceo of a company within like a local big company like maybe a local company in malaysia and you're the ceo of that versus literally working as a corporate sale in one of the like the big management companies that's the kind of difference that you're talking about in this debate because in a in a big big and established party i think in most instances of policies yes they're going to be similar and have similar amount of benefits to maybe the majority of people and similar to like what progressive individuals may want but the difference here is majorly about like claiming the benefit of you being an influential person and having a larger political career in terms of you being a better established polit uh, political person in a party that grows with the years of influence and like the influence continues to and continues to grow and sort of establishes your career as an influential political person i think that's the kind of sort of distinction in this debate and that is important to know because i'm not going to claim a benefit of saying that we'll have massive policies i think a lot of these policies would be co-opted by opposition anyway the bigger difference is where do you get to have a say in terms of what specific policies you want to happen where do you get to have a say more in terms of what specific changes you want where are you valued more as a political person can be more proud to propose I thank the speaker. I'd like to next invite the leader of opposition. Hi, can I check if I'm audible? Yep, loud and clear. Yep. I'll take POI globally from Tobin. One day, I hope to better my country by representing my people and to enact policy changes that will help Malaysia be better. This is a dream and vision of every politician, and there is no different in this debate. Make no mistake. This debate isn't about whether Muda or PH is better for Malaysia, but rather as a young politician, which is better not only for your political career, but also fulfilling your objectives and goals as a politician. Firstly, OG came up and told us a few things. They told you, they told you like, uh, like firstly, your ability to appeal to like, that your ability to appeal to the youth is going to be gone. And this is simply like not true because in the majority of parties, if you most specifically in Malaysia, parties want to appeal to the new generation of voters. This means adopting like 
young people and embracing like your your youth because your youth are your biggest supporters of your more liberal policies and the youth want their idea to be heard. This means that if a party chooses to neglect the youth, they're going to lose out in terms of voter base. And parties need that youth vote to maintain their popularity. So you, as a as a politician in a center left party, as a progressive politician in a center left party, you also try to appeal to the youth rather than appealing to the old. I'm going to tell you why further down in my speech, why you can still appeal to both sides as much as possible within this debate. Moreover, you're also giving, like, having these politicians, having, as a progressive politician being in a centre-left party, you're also giving youth politicians a platform which completely dismantles opposition change because having a youth politician in such a huge party already gives you that voice, it already gives you that platform to make your ideas be heard. Now, I'll be going on to my arguments. Firstly, why joining PH gives you better access to elect change? As a liberal politician and centre-left party, we already see some breathing room for progressive policies. Since PH is the current leader and likely to be likely to be at least opposed to Muda in the long term, joining PH secures your future as a politician in the long term. Firstly, the majority of individuals are likely to buy into your ideas and give you the proper platform to be heard. I mean, just look at status quo, where the only prominent Muda member is Syed Sadiq, and where really only the youth really buy into him, rather than like other people in Malaysia. The unique benefit of being a, youth, a young politician in a centre-left party is that as a politician, you have the ability to have the youth's voice be heard on a much higher and grander scale. In comparison, when you go to Muda, you're likely going to be dismissed by other parties, especially when you're already in the minority party, and likely to be overshadowed by bigger players in that minority party, like people like Syed Sadiq. This means, firstly, you aren't, you aren't as likely to get as much buy-in from people outside of the youth. And, and secondly, you're principally unlikely to enact proper change when these ideas get outvoted by the larger party. When you already agree that significant buy-in occurs on the outside by being centerless, you appeal to more people principally, and people give more significance to your policies rather than dismissing your ideas entirely if you're in a full progressive party like Muda. On top of buy-in, we argue that your policies are likely to get enacted for two reasons as a young politician. Firstly, PH is a large party, really, your policies are likely to be given more spotlight being from a bigger party and being from a bigger party already provides you some validity because people like to vote on parties that have been long in like have been long with uh, in the political spectrum in the political sphere parties that have been, been around for quite a while as OG already pointed out PH has been around for quite a while and secondly parties have an added incentive to appeal to the youth as well this means that as a politician your political career is quite secure because the PH would want to keep you around to capture that youth vote this means that as a politician, not only are you going to have a secure future, especially in the long term, it means that the PH is likely to also push you up to bigger positions because they want you, they need you to capture that you vote and they're probably going to give you the spotlight that you deserve as a politician and as well as keeping you around, pushing you to higher positions. Moreover, we like to argue that you also go beyond and argue that you also gain some buy-in from the centre because being in a centre-left party, you can appeal to individuals on, on the, in the centre part of the political spectrum by, for example, like incorporating certain left, like progressive re centre rhetoric into your policy to make your policies more appealing to a lot of individuals. This, and moreover, political parties would again want to leverage on you and give your voice to the youth. And this means that your, one, that your policies are likely to be had and gain more buy-in, which has a overall higher likelihood of making your policies more uh, making your policies higher your policies getting enacted. Secondly, we also like joining PH will mean like the greater streamline of our policy making because already the Malaysian government is quite fragmented as having a unity government means that political decisions aren't are going to take quite a long time quite a long time because the vote has to go through a lot of different parties. But being from the PH means that your vote is likely to get more buy-in from the political party itself. And Rather than, if, in comparison, when you go to Muda and you like say your policy ideas, you're likely to get shut down by all the other parties as well. So the impact of this is really PY? just, uh, yeah, I think a PY. Uh, PH already has to like share resources. Even if you join Muda, you'll share resources. Why is resources the tipping point in this debate? We don't think the resources is the tipping point. We think that like having, like just being principally being bigger than PH being bigger than Muda already sets the position on a more stable career and that resources like 
being PH just gives the position a better future in their political career. Lastly, I'm going to talk about like why joining PH gives you a better form of representation. The role of a politician is to serve the people by serving as an extension of themselves in parliament. As a politician, your role is to represent the views of individuals. And when you're a young politician, politician, youths are already more inclined to buy into you because on a principal level, you already represent the youth. Next, the next step is to represent other people as well. Everything that's more easily done on the side of PH because politicians can easily, like as a young politician, you want to also garner as many votes as possible. This means going down to like different like people from different areas, people from different ages, generations, and finding out issues that they are facing because you want to appeal to them and you want to serve your job as, as representing them. This means as comparison to Muda where you're only likely to uh, to focus on the youth because as a full left party, that's your main demographic. We think that Joining PH means that no, you, you also represent more people and this also affects the, the way you decide policy because now your policies in return addresses the problems of people on a much higher scale. It addresses the problems of more individuals. And we think this is not only better for the political career of these young politicians, but it's also better in making Malaysia a much better country and a more stable a country that's better for politics. Speaker, let's invite the Deputy Prime Minister. Good. Uh, hello, am I visible and audible? Yep, both are clear. Okay, great. Hi, Somitra going DPM, he, him pronouns. Uh, if I want to take a POI, I'll just say that and then you can unmute please don't unmute yourself Uh, starting in three, two, one. I'm going to talk about two broad things in this speech. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the general ability that an individual has to get a voice and why that's something that's important to an individual. The second thing I'm going to talk about is change and why that's still relatively, even if we do prove that, even if either side is able to prove that it does get some sort of change, why that's still not necessarily the most important thing from the perspective of a progressive youth politician. So let's talk about the ability to get a voice. First thing to consider here is how does this happen? And like all of this is going to respond to what you get from opening opposition. I think the idea is since Muda is likely to be more progressive than PH, it's more likely that the value system that you believe in as a progressive youth is more closely matched by Muda as opposed to PH. What that means is when you have discussions with other members of your political party, you feel like firstly, your ideas are something that is important and they're not something that you're having to trade off at every single individual. Because a center left party inherently is one that does make compromises and does make trade-offs in order to achieve its goals. As Muda, even if after the elections you form a coalition, even if after the elections you form a coalition party, while campaigning for the elections, you still stand for the principles that you believe in. Like that's literally what Bernie Sanders does, even if he's an independent in the United States. Why is this like important for an individual, right? I think the idea is that as an individual, you necessarily care about your value system being given some importance, your value system being something that you aren't forced to trade off at every single instance, which means at a point of time which you're not forced to make these trade offs, you feel like your voice is something that inherently is something that is that has a lot of value, which is why people are very, very likely to engage with you, which is why even when engaging with other people, you're likely to do it in a healthier way as opposed to on the comparative. So why does why does this like matter at all though in the round right i think the first thing to consider here as an individual you feel valued because you feel like your opinions matter within the party you feel like people within the your party feel like there is some ally some like value attached to the principles that you're pushing for which is why those people are not which is why the other members in party are not that keen to trade off the principles that you're standing for even in the cases where you never come into power we feel like this impact and benefit to the actor is outcome independent because you don't have to give up on the three principles that you believe in something 
which is extremely, extremely likely to happen if you try to like come into power into center left parties, simply because of the fact that they do feel like trade offs are something that's important. But more importantly, even if they are, uh, the, 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 these center left parties are not extremely progressive in nature, they just do it to attract a voter base. Again, it's not necessarily like they're standing up for the huge values that you stand for. Because as someone, who comes from these parties? I think the second thing to consider uh, these uh, this as a progressive youth. I think there's one more thing to consider here. You want to be in a position where you feel like you're making a difference, right? And I think it's important to consider that Muda is small and growing. Yes, it's a party that has been founding in the last few years, and it probably doesn't have a huge seat at the wider discussion table. And the seat is likely to be small right now. But this is something that changes over time. The whole point of developing parties which have hugely distinct and diverse ideas compared to the parties that exist in status quo is that you want to break out of those echo chambers that exist you want to have more and more perspectives coming up you want to shift you want to shift the way in which political discourse is happening right now when you do this as a, when you do this as a part of a smaller party you inherently are in a position where you take more drastic stances or you say stuff that is wild compared to the center left party which starts discourse which starts to push for any sort of change not what aoc is doing in the democratic party within her like group of like extreme liberal people there, right what they do is inherently try to interact with the engaging system and feel like they're making a change as an individual it, as an individual this means firstly the idea that the party has a small seat at the table right now hence doesn't have much resources and all isn't really that consequential this is something that is likely to change over time but secondarily as a specific individual you feel like you're in a position where you can actively contribute to bringing about changes the way that you want to bring about changes because you aren't compromising on the principles that you stand for inherently. But the third thing to consider here in terms of why having a voice is important is because it gives you a large chunk of relatability to other members in your party. This is extremely likely to be high when you join a party with a lot of other young people. These are likely to be people who have similar values to you, who believe in things like large-scale income redistribution, who believe in things like getting more and more rights for women, even at the expense of like a huge backlash from the right wing who wants to get rid of corruption in general that exists within the political system. Yes, the central left polar probably believes in this too. The difference is in terms of the scale in which they believe in this, the difference in the scale, the difference in the amount they share these values with you. This inherently gives you much more satisfaction as an individual because you don't feel like you're trading every single thing off. You feel like even when you interact with other members in this party, they consider your opinions to be valid, more so considering this is likely to be people who come from the same demographic as you, not in terms of like race, but in terms of like age in terms of like the sim uh, having an extremely extremely similar mindset like think, think of it this way right bernie is an independent who pushes for extreme left ideas he has hugely different views than the democratic party in general where he doesn't give up on the values he stands for that doesn't mean that means he doesn't win every election yes but he stands by his principles he motivates people and more importantly he's getting more and more support from the progressive youth which is why it's become easier for him to win elect to like be in positions where he's actually able to win elections when we have more and more young people coming up now Nowadays, we can get into a position where we can eventually enact change. But regardless, change isn't the most important outcome here. It's likely to be symmetric because even in our world, you're still going to have to like make coalitions at some point of time. It's about where as an individual you feel most comfortable and where you feel the most valuable, where you feel like your opinions are one that matter overall. The other way to look at this is in terms of compromises, right? What Op says here is that lots of people are likely to buy into your narratives in their world. They are likely to buy into narratives, maybe. But those are not your narratives. Those are compromise narratives that you have to deal with. Those are trade-offs. These are trade-offs that you have to make. Op talks about the principle of how you don't want to make trade-offs and you want to have a secure political career. It's unclear how your political career is something that's secure. That's not a guaranteed benefit. It's not like the PH won the election by a smashing mountain. They won by forming coalitions with smaller parties, even with parties such as One Seat, such as Muda, meaning their so-called stability is speculative. So PH does have a bigger platform to talk about policies right now, yes. But they aren't the same policies you believe in. Like at least when you campaign campaign for Muda, even if you do form coalitions post-elections, during the campaigning process, you talk about the policies that you think are important, the changes that you feel that should be made. But I want to impact this in terms of the existing political stagnation that exists, right? A youth-led party is more and more likely to change and grow in influence over time. It's a new face of politicians in a time of political stagnation. It's the idea that we want to bring about large-scale change. And people like to see these new politicians coming forward. Like the same way in Aam Admi, uh, like we saw in Delhi, right? When the Aam Admi party came into power, because 
because people were tired of the BJP and Congress scenes who were operating on the center right and center left spectrums. And he, the youth was realizing that these people weren't actually making change. Every year when more and more people turn 18 and vote, these people go out and vote for progressive parties. I think the most proximate thing to the actor here is to support what they're believing in. We maximize that. Ops mechanism is one where they have to compromise at every instance. And regardless of outcomes, we think that's a bad thing in and of itself. Vote opening gov. I thank the speaker and like to next invite the deputy leader of opposition to conclude opening half. Hi, am I audible? Yep, loud and clear. All right. So give me a second. Let the sirens fit. Can I'd like to also remind all teams in the round to please offer and accept POIs for engagement purposes. Yep. I'll just like to mention, I'll take my POIs verbally. And I'll begin my speech in three, two. I think as a member of the youth right in our generation, it's often for us easily to get starry-eyed and behind rose-tinted glasses. But unfortunately, on the side of opening opposition today, we have to be pragmatic and we must argue to settle for change rather than try to enact change that's bigger than what we can even bite on in the first place. Now, let's begin by attacking opening government. We tell that opening government makes one very simple mistake, right? They frequently assert time and time again that these old, that that Pakatan Harapan is going to be, have this established structure and hierarchy that cannot change, that's going to be very rigid, that's going to be very old and boomerish with lots of old people inside who are unwilling to hear the opinions of the youth. How we tell you that for a group of old fogies in the first place to even consider and accept being centre-left, right? They must be somewhat, we must concede that they are somewhat open-minded in the first place, right? We must make concessions that they are likely to break apart from your average mole of a politician who tries to appeal to the very conservative consensus of Malaysia. I think the biggest part missing in this debate today that we see, right, is the fact that we don't consider the political backdrop in Malaysia. We don't consider who are your voters. We don't consider like what are the political norms and the policy norms there. And this is what my speech is going to enlighten you about and going to tell you why we should be consolidating the left in order to be combating the stronger and strongest conservative rhetoric that we see coming from, that we see coming from this round of elections. So very simply put, we need to understand that in order for us to be able to successfully bring left-wing policies to light, we need to understand that the right, that the right and the conservative rhetoric that we see in Malaysia is very deeply entrenched in their rhetoric, is very deeply entrenched in like commonplace Malaysian rhetoric. This is why rights for women and even very conservative policies like the Bumi Putra policy often don't necessarily receive a lot of change, right? It's because the left is fragmented. And we cannot be having this as a, as a, as a young starry-eyed politician, right? We want to be able to enact change in order for us to be able to create greater success and influence down the road, like what open, opening government wants. We need to be able to best appeal to, to voters by being able to bring policies to light, by being able to champion these policies to light in the first place. We tell you that the, the characterization brought to us by opening government or how these established structures and hierarchies are going to lock out the youth and not allow them to speak is completely ridiculous, right? We, my previous speaker already came up and told you that the, that the biggest consumer of the centre-left rhetoric is not going to be someone who's like middle-aged or someone who's, who is very old. It's going to be the youth, right? Because the youth are the ones who didn't grow up in Malaysia during the times of very, during the times of very conservative rhetoric. They are the ones who experience the most of like education, of what education has to offer in terms of broadening their horizon and allowing them to become more acceptable and make left-wing policies appear more palatable to them in the first place. We tell you that this means that the, the centre-left policy, the centre-left Pakatan Harapan is likely going to be appealing towards the youth and they need to be able, to, and in order for them to do this, there's a great you incentive are. above their head, no thank you, there's a great incentive above their head for them to be able to accept and recruit more and more young people towards their cause and to not just recruit them for a performative or tokenistic reason, right? Because they're going to be under heavy scrutiny as one of the only coalition of, okay, not one of the only, but the only coalition that formed throughout this. They are going to also, they're going to also want to secure it for their own sake in the next political, political election. So we tell them that, we tell you that this incentive right here is what will destabilize the assumption that is made by opening, opening government. So now we move on to talking about the, the, main, the main point on how we want to expedite policy making and create more youth-centered politics, right? We tell you that we, number one, begin expediting policies by making sure that there is no infighting on the left. I think the left can agree that what it means to be the left 
is that we acknowledge certain principles, right? There's certain common ground that we are able to find with one another that certain groups of people deserve more help than others. We tell you that certain groups of disenfranchised people deserve more help than others because we have a duty towards them. And this critical point is what differs the left from the right, right? And it's what enables the left to operate in the first place. We tell you that these common ground principles, while we may disagree in terms of being centre-left and, and very progressive, in terms of what it truly means to help them and how we should execute, you know, I... execute set policies, no thank you. We tell you that... We tell you that what that doesn't, we tell you that that is a very short sighted way of looking at it, right? We tell you that in the broad scheme of things, what we want to do is end up taking the first step to help these people. And we tell you that the best way for us to do that is to integrate with the larger policy that has already established structure and hierarchy and like supporter base. Because, like in the previous uh, opening of opening government mentioned, they have already been operating for a longer period of time and they've likely accrued a substantial amount of like youths to their cause who are very passionate about the center left. And we think that in, all, in order for us. Hold on. In order for us to be able to successfully prevent a confrontational adversarial relationship that alienates the various the various groups of the left wing, we need to we need to base we need to base our policy making on what's commonplace and what's intersectional as an intersectional interest between all of these groups. But before I move on, yes, I'll take the PY. Uh, you're probably going to have change on either side. You're a person who's up and coming means you lack influence. Why, with such little influence, people will listen to what you have to say? Why is your burden change when you're young and? Like no influence. Yeah, but this is all going to occur when the voter base is like voting or that. When things really get, when the gears really get moving and you really get moving to parliament, right? We think that there's going to be a lot of very vocal discourse between the different progressive lefts. And we think that this discourse is not necessarily a bad thing, but there's going to be agreement. There's going to be disagreements within there that will limit the ability for policies to be able to push through, right? On specifically what it means to be the left. Because when you realize that in the broader scheme of things within a parliament, you're not just going from, you're not just going to be confronting on a left against left basis. It's going to be the left against the conservative conventional right, right wing rhetoric that we see in Malaysia, right? This means that we need to be able to consolidate our groups together for us to be able to get a stronger voice on the left. And then we see that this perfectly integrates into the incentive structure for this young politician. We tell you that when we look at Khan, we can, we've already seen like the failures of, of groups that are not able to agree in overseas, right? Look at, uh, look at Burma in the past where they have like so many groups that are fragmented similar to what we see in Malaysia. We think that we want to try to avoid something like that where there's so many diverse interests. We want to be able to find commonality and common ground between these political groups for us to be able to enact change to the people that matter most in this debate that we have forgotten in the opening half, that being, that being the voters and in terms of what they want to see in the long run. We say that when we are able to join, when we are able to join uh, the larger group like Fakata Harapan, we're able to make ourselves make a name for ourselves because what we do is we end up building relationships with, with individuals who are already in power and individuals who, have, who are renowned and have reputation, we are able to take and gradually grab their voter base and grab their voter base in the long run also. And in the event that, look, we acknowledge that in the event that Pakata Harapan is not what it seems, we tell you that what's going to happen is that we are able to somewhat capture or rock some of the voter bases to be able to pull over towards Muda in the future if we decide to change parties. We tell you that this is nothing is cemented and nothing is concrete. We tell you that what is able to, we tell you that in the long run, we, what we want to do is be able to seize the political we want to be able to politically capture the voter base. We want to be able to create our influence by, by, by using the underlying rhetoric behind Perkata Harapan and gradually moving it over towards Muda in the event that Perkata Harapan does not uphold to his promises and is nothing like what I, I put out in my speech of them being open to change and open to giving voices to youth. With all that I said, go with the side that best represents the interests of the youth and minorities within Malaysia to make it a more progressive place. Go with the opening of the position. I thank the speaker and everyone for a opening half. Now to open closing half, I invite the member of government. Hi, my honorable. Yep, clear. Hope you are truly chat, please. So don't unmute yourself as I found it disrupting. <clears throat> Let me set my timer. I'll start my speech in three two one the opening debate has come to this which is that on opening government you can fight for your ideal values but it can take a long time while on oo they say that you can compromise your values as long as you can get instant results this is the deadlock right we think the way cg is going to break this deadlock and answer that to you is by proving that first i will give you context of 
um, how Malaysia um, politics works, which is that they usually rely on coalition. So um, most likely that PH and Muda will be in a coalition regardless. So then the question is not about um, whether we are on the same side or not, because we will in the coalition, since what we are fighting for is going to be Barisan Nasional, um, the Conservative Party. But rather, the question is, when we are in the same coalition, which sides should we fight for in that coalition? So CG will be the one to answer that um, because OG also they bring idea how oh you need to pave the way for Buddha as a political party to build power as time goes on. This like urgency because right now what matters is putting yourself in a strategic position in this election. Therefore, their prerequisite is to um their prerequisite of long term is to first um like secure your position in the short term and CG will answer that. Although I will say for example that PH is more progressive enough, I think they would still be moderate. Therefore. Um, what we need to talk about is power imbalance. Um, CG's contribution is how Muda's power will be better in the coalition if we as these young pol um, progressive politicians join Muda instead of PH. Um, why is this important? Because we need to be contextualized. Since it's a hung election, that means who's going to win is a coalition like the party that can um, form the fastest coalition in which that coalition will have the most um win the most seats in the election so that's the metrics um therefore um i will frame the opening debate by explaining that since muda will pledge to page anyway compromise happen on both sides of the house the difference is how much we are going to compromise and cg will tell you why we will compromise less on um on um, government team than if we were to compromise um on on oo um all my rebuttals for oo will be integrated in my arguments but for oo i just like to point out that if they say that um if you are young you will still be hurt in ph then it's not really exclusive when i already give you context of the coalition this politician is young regardless so therefore they can also win the influence in muda if um oh on the other hand say that in buddha they are dismissed it's uh, like they, they never provide explanation why that's the likely case so going to my extension then um so, so the the big political party is Pakatan Harapan versus Barisan Nasional, which is both uh, like Pakatan Harapan is progressive, at least like center left, and Barisan Nasional is at least somewhat center right. The likelihood for a coalition to happen is because no one in the election won majority. That means the one that can win is the one that can attract more, more allies, since the number of seats in the parliament is the deciding factor. That means currently both PH and BN is finding ally. This is a momentum for smaller political party. Why is that the case? Because um, the how coalition works is that it's interesting because although uh, at a glance from the context slides, it might be intuitive to think that Muda is weaker on the basis that they only won one seat in the election while PH probably got more. But why would then in the coalition, Although Muda only won one seat, Muda would still get bargaining power. Why? Because small number can be the determining factor in this kind of thing. An analogy for this is swing states in the US election. Yeah, swing states, it's probably one or two, but they're the one that decide the result. So in this case of Malaysian politics, in a race where um, the sites that can make coalition that has the most seats in the parliament is the one, the, is the site that wins. That means small political parties are actually gold in this case. That's why although Buddha only have one seat, it's the one that determine the result. And that's why, um, we get, um, like we will be hurt by PH. The conclusion is that, um, power imbalance will not be that sparse. And this also, um, engaged to, um, OO's concern about how then, um, you need to be in a place where, you know, you at least can win some sort of policy we we are going to say that since this is the context of the coalition therefore buddha will be heard um second layer of this is then when you're in a coalition as buddha instead of ph what kind of discussion will happen because opening talk about you know one liner about coalition one liner about discussion but never even explain what kind of discussion and why that discussion will fulfill the interests of the young progressive politicians we think the discussion will look like this ph will automatically fight for moderation and buddha will fight for more left policies so yeah they are kind of similar in that sense but they are going to kind of um they're going to be on a 
a slightly different spectrums and that's the uh, and that's going to be what the debate is right should we be more moderate or should we be, be like be an uh, at all out extreme left in which yeah you're just going to be that progressive i think if you fight as muda in that coalition that means you will be on site that fight for your interests in the coalition you will be on site that push ph or push this coalition to be like um you need for example um you cannot be that moderate because you will need to cater to the progressive people or to the progressive voters we're going to be the one that push for that kind of discussion to happen if then this young politicians um doesn't join muda i think i i doubt that that kind of discussion can manifest or i doubt then the young politicians will be in that discussion because if you're in ph you will have to fight for the side that fight for moderation which is against that value before i go to my conclusion i'll take one from oo if PH and Muda keep disagreeing on these matters regarding the left, how are they ever going to engage on the right and combat conservative rhetoric? Here's the thing. Um, if you're talking about how we have a common enemy, yes, we're going to have a common enemy because we're going to make policies that is going to be very, very different with the conservative. But um, what I meant by discussion is that discussion inside, so internal political discussion. So all, so I'm saying that we can make extreme stance against our enemy, but as Muda, we can also treat PH in a way that show our stance or in a way that show our strategy or position. Therefore, it's not mutually exclusive that just because we fight for our interest in the coalition, it means that we will be too busy fighting against ourselves to fight the Barisan National. It just doesn't make sense. The conclusion on this is that um, you have the chance to voice out your ideal value. You should fight for that side in the coalition. Why is this better than OG? Because although they bring idea about how you cannot compromise value, but CG is the one that say it's, it's unjustified. The reason is because you could have won by not compromising. So there's literally no need for you to compromise when in a coalition, you would still be hurt. Therefore, this also attack urgency from OO when they say that, um, um, you know, you will not be hurt and everything. We are the one that proves to you that PH will listen to Muda. And also, although OO keeps saying that, um, you know, this agreement is bad, we tell you that it's necessary. And that's why we need to fight for the right side proud to propose. I thank the speaker. I'd like to next invite the member of opposition. Hey, uh, can I be seen and heard? Yep, all okay. clear. All right, um, POI is in the chat. <laughs> Two extensions in the speech. Firstly, on how we can better bolster career advancements, and secondly, on how we can better serve our political interests as a young progressive Malaysian politician. Firstly, in terms of career advancement, uh, the first piece of context, unlike what CG asserts, is that presumably you don't have a seat in government right now and you are not a sitting politician for the reason that you haven't joined a party yet, which means that you actually have to win a seat. In the context of the hung parliament, where Muda was only able to win one seat, that means that the chance of you actually winning a seat in the upcoming election is incredibly, incredibly small. And that means that if you don't win a seat, you basically auto lose this debate. Because if you don't have a seat, you can't have a voice in government, you can't have an influence over votes, you, your, your career is just dead until the next term. Which means that the whole debate that happens in the opening half about how much a voice you have just doesn't exist because you don't have that voice or platform at all. The second thing to note is that in comparison, in PH, you're far more likely to be benefited by very generous party infrastructure. Because because that party is the establishment party that provides a platform that has campaigning and marketing uh, and general kind of monetary resources. And the important thing to note here is that the rhetoric of opening government is that, well, you're a, you know, you're a small fish in a big pond, so you know that party will never really listen to you. But they forget the context of 2019, where the Malaysian government lowered the voting age to from 21 to 18, which has brought in 5 million extra young voters, which means that your position within PH is particularly, particularly influential and becomes far more more influential into the future if young people join Muda, which means that within PH resources are disproportionately likely to be directed towards you. But thirdly, for a number of structural reasons, it is incredibly unlikely that Muda will ever become influential. Firstly, because the position of Muda on the political spectrum is situated to the left 
of PH, as opposed to the other two major parties uh, that are to the right of PH, which means that Muda will always have to form a coalition with PH because it's not going like, to form a coalition with the nationalistic right wing government, which means that you have very little leverage as that party and you have no choice to form a coalition. Secondly, Muda and PH plan to engage in electoral pact, which literally just means like they vote for all the same shit, which means the delta on their side is very small. Thirdly, Malaysia operates in a first past post system, which means that like it's unlike preferential voting where your incentive as a voter is often to vote for, for example, a smaller party as your first vote and then let that preference run off if the first party doesn't win. In a first past the post system, voters will always want to vote for the party that is most likely to win because in that proportional system, they're the ones that will get the seat, which means that a small party like Muda will probably never really get the critical mass of votes to get more than that one seat. And fourthly, uh, the Malaysian government recently banned electoral hopping. And this is really important because the reason why Muda came to power in the first place was because a number of influential young people like Sied, that guy who like won Australs a few years ago uh, fr from Malaysia, who's a very cool debater who gave a speech uh, at Malaysian Australs. Uh, he actually hopped from, uh, you know, PH to Muda and was able to establish his base there. But the problem is that those young influential people can no longer hop, which means that a lot of the really powerful people that you want to get on your side are no longer able to join Muda into the future, which means that Muda's progress has been stopped there. Why is this important? Because government bench relies on an intuition that the youth are a big force and therefore the party will grow. So even if you don't have power now, in the long run, you won't, you will get power. But we provide a number of structural reasons as to why this never will happen, which means that if your goal is to enter government and make change and be heard, you must join PH. Second extension, how do we better serve your political interests? Obviously, you are progressive, but you also want to cater for the youth because your background is, you know, alongs other young people and you care about youth issues. And obviously, also, you want to, you want other youth to be progressive, right? You want to persuade other youth to be progressive. The underlying false assumption of this debate is the idea that youth are just blanket progressive, which is maybe true in the US examples that opening era honestly use, but it's not true in Malaysia because the assumption from the other teams that all youth in Malaysia are progressive is just factually wrong. The youth in Malaysia are particularly polarized. This is firstly because of massive rural urban educational divides, wherein the other two big parties in government, which are uh, not in government, in, in, in the parliament, which is UMNO and Baratsu, have a rhetoric of economic enfranchisement, have populist policies that are able to win over the young that are disaffected within massive populations in rural pockets of Malaysia. But Secondly, because the large proportion of Malaysian youth have gone through a recent process of Arabization. And that is firstly because you, the UMNO uh, government, which is the previous government in power, uh, spurred nationalistic media narratives that focus on the Muslim Malaysian identity, but also closer to ties to the uh, Middle East, has meant that countries like Saudi Arabia have begun to radicalize youth uh, within Malaysia through things like propaganda, through things like social media campaigns, through things like school programs. What does this mean? This means that the youth in Malaysia are uniquely polarized. They're not just like progressive. Like you can't just assume that all young people are aggressive, progressive. And this was very apparent in the recent election because in the recent election, the reason why there was that hung parliament is because they lowered the voting age from 21 to 18 and that massive young bloc did not all just vote for the progressive parties. They were actually very, very, very split. Why is this important? important to you because you are probably someone who's young who has friends who went to school that you know turn to extremist views or increasingly nationalistic and as a progressive you probably want to win them over on a progressive side uh before that i'll take a point from cg if you have one Although, let's just say that your characterization is right, that young voters are polarized, that doesn't uh, really matter to the young politicians as long as we're fighting for that right side Okay, so this is where I'm going to get to why it's important to become an uh, MPH. The problem is that if you want to win those people over, you can't do that within Muda. Because when you're in Muda, you're painted with an inherently progressive mark and stereotype, and you're unable to reach out. You Your position in Muda entrenches that polarization because you adopt a set of very left-wing progressive policies that like nobody agrees with. That means that your views six come off and are perceived as irreconcilable with the other side, which means that not only are you less likely to get the youth vote, but you're unlikely to be able to reach out and tackle issues that affect the youth across the board and not just within cities. 
in comparison, when you're in pH, you come off as more polarizing. You come off with an ability to actually reach across the political aisle. And that's because pH is a far more moderate centrist party and is a party that is experienced in engaging in coalitions, which means that not only can you help moderate and engage in the discourse across that polarization, but you can actually persuade youth. Because instead of talking about like things like LGBT rights, which by the way, in Malaysia, like no one cares about because you know it's like the country literally has anti-homosexuality laws and most people in Malaysia are very conservative on that issue. You can talk about a number of other moderate policies which are able to win over those sides, reduce extremism and bring people over in the long run, which is the kind of interest that you want to claim. At the end of this debate, our team was the one that firstly actually engaged in the structures and nuances of Malaysian politics, but secondly, we were the side that was pragmatic rather than relying on a Muda that was never likely to grow into the future, we were able to get progressive, pro progressive, pragmatic change, moderate policy, and reach across the aisle. For these reasons, we are very, very proud to oppose. I thank the speaker for that speech. I'd like to invite the government whip to close off the government bench. Here, here. Hello, am I audible? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, okay. Give me a moment to um, tidy up my notes. No worries. Okay, sorry. Am I still audible? Yep. Okay. Um, preferred POI methods through the chat. Please don't unmute unless like I got this content or my voice gets choppy. Okay, starting my speech in three, two. One, the framing of this debate is what is the best, what is going to best fulfill the interests of this progressive young uh, Malaysian politician, right? I'm going to divide uh, my uh, speech into three parts. First, engaging towards CO, then towards O, and lastly, differentiating ourselves with OG based on uh, the framing I've mentioned. Right, let's talk about CO right, for engagements towards this. First of all, let's point out that CO directly, on, directly clashes with OG, talking only about the structure of the party for career advancements, right? This is a deadlock that happens on the long diagonal that even CEO doesn't want to engage or whether or not it's better for them to go into a, an established uh, structure or come or go to a new up and coming party, right? Let's talk about why the fact, let's point out uh, first engage, direct engagement is talking about why established parties is no is very unlikely to accept you because as you notice, something that has never been explained by CEO is the process analysis. You need to understand is this is not just about a structure, politi a structure political party, but they have certain values at serve. Self. So you need to actually be able to explain why a mod, why established and concrete moderate, uh, moderate center left party would most likely accept this progressive who is uh, who is very towards the left compared to what they are. So we tell you that's not going to be the case. It is going to be a conflict of interest, and most likely, even if you do get a seat, even if you do get a seat, or even if you do get some sort of power, it's not going to be a very powerful one, as you do not have the same interest as what the party conveys. So the biggest benefit coming from CEO has already fall, fallen on our side we tell you that we are going to be involved much better with muda and because of the same interest right? and this is a much better response than what og tells you because og only tells you that oh it's a new party it means it's easier to go in structure wise where cg is the one who actually contextualizes what is the nature of this party themselves and why if the nature is similar it is most likely going you ending up becoming a member there is going to push the power uh, party to be much stronger and that is why the career advancement is much more important on our side of the house right but before but second engagement career advancement is not really that important in this debate right because if this actor that we're talking about is a good enough politician and is able to like win debates and everything right they can be established regardless anywhere else so we think this extra deadlock that ceo tells you is not that important in the debate let's talk about what is actually important about the values that cg has been highlighting right second engagement, right? 
a CO tells you leverage does not exist because uh, Muda will never join any other parties that isn't PH. Let's uh, contextualize and talk about coalition. And this is something that CO has the burden to actually engage to. The coalition will always listen to all of the members because you have the need to all of the votes for members to be able to pass anything. Right? This is the leverage. This is why people are willing to compromise. And this is the prerequisite to actually making the, the coalition on our side to actually be strong and to actually win. Right? This is the biggest thing. And this is something CEO has to engage with. Third engagement, right? They tell you there's only one seat in Muda and everyone will fight for that. And it's unlikely that our actor is going to get that, right? We tell you the interest on our side of the house is not for you to get the seat, but the interest is for the values to be upheld, right? Because we've told you again, being a successful politician is also depends on the characteristics of this actor that we do not have any context to about, right? So we're talking about which one is able to fulfill their interest as a progressive politician. Only CG talks about that, right? And lastly, the uh, CEO tells you young voters aren't always 100% progressive. But we tell you, sure, even if we cannot cater to 100% of the young voters, we're catering towards the progressiveness and we're able to target that voters. So if in the end of the day, uh, the biggest burden, C if the burden CEO wants to talk about is how to actually sway the young voters, we tell you young voters will be attracted to better change because they themselves as the next generation has already been fed up with whatever conservative values their parents place on them, whatever the government has failed upon them. So they are willing to have any change. That's why it's more progressive values as well what Muda has promised is going to be much better. And that's going to what sway the young voters we CO has followed, right? Two engagements towards opening opposition. Open first thing, opening opposition tells you, oh, policies will be faster if it is enacted in PH and uh, because it is moderate left, right? Let's point out that the stance in opening opposition is playing safe and having a soft stance. And we tell you why then this is very unstrategic because this debate isn't about how fast can you pass the policies. That yeah, if you always cater and cut corners for conservative and right wing, obviously it's easy to pass policies, right? So this case coming from OO doesn't stand because as a young progressive politician, your interest is not just to pass any policy, right? But it's to pass the policies that are actually progressive and have the interest to actually fulfill your progressive needs, right? Especially since OO Will never explain how then the policies on their side looks like, right? So we're going to contextualize and tell you it's always going to on their side. It's always going to be policies that are um, moderate left, mo moderate left. So that's why they're never going to be enough, right? That that's why the actual interest of the progress uh, of the actual interest of these uh, progressive uh, politician is to actually have progressive policies that are not tokenistic. And this is a much better response than what OG has told you because OG is dismissive, telling you that oh the policies are hundred percent bad. We tell you that even if they're good to a certain percent like 50 percent and everything that is still not enough so the not enough stance we tell you that exclusively happens in oo has fallen that's the first engagement right second engagement talking about uh, before going on to that let's take the poi from oo left-leaning policies are never going to be able to get passed when in the backdrop of all the conservative rhetoric within parliament if you don't allow them to get consolidated Okay, that directly goes into my second engagement towards OO, talking about all of their impacts and how that is not exclusive, right? Four things scattered upon two speakers coming in OO and how we directly engage to it. First thing they tell you as a young politician, you, you will always want to be heard. We tell you this doesn't make sense of why it's an exclusive case on their side because if the actor in this debate, as what the motion says, is young in this characteristic, they're always going to be heard regardless of whether what party they're in, right? So it's much better on our side instead when they have they are young and they take a bold stance because this is what interests people more. They want change for what the existing government has already failed upon them. So first benefit falls, right? Second thing, they tell you Muda will not be heard because Malaysian is too conservative. This is exactly the POI they gave, right? We tell, to, we tell you that PH is still moderate left, which means it's also their burden to explain why then even if half, half, half left means it, that they're going to be heard by the Malaysian conservative anyway, right? It's because if the portrayal of Malaysia is that conservative, we tell you PH policies will then be compromised towards more of a right-wing policy, and that is not good on their side of the house, right? That is what we tell you why then it's not going to be better on our side of the house, because Muda goes directly against the conservative. This stronger stance is going to be much able to reach to a better compromise, reach a much better policies. We take their, we tell you why their second impact falls, right? Their third impact coming from OO is how then it, it is to appeal towards the youth as OO says the youth is progressive. So we tell you that the youth does not appeal towards PH at his house stands because yeah, why do you want to vote healthily for uh, sure, you get half the benefits, but the half of it still actually harms you. That's not how the youth will not appeal on their side. But the second response, if the goal of OO is to have a, but a youth appeal, it's going to be more appealing with Muda. And last thing, the fourth thing is talking about disagreements in this course. This is where OO's half stance is most fatal because if OO doesn't want to have any disagreements, 
with a, ver a majority conservative uh, Malaysia, this is when none of their policies will pass. We take this debate. I thank the speaker and I connect and invite the opposition whip to conclude the debate. Here, here. All right, um, POI is in chat, please. CG loves to talk about deadlocks, which is why the first thing we're going to do is just wipe out CG from closing half so that no deadlock can possibly occur. CG's extension falls for a few reasons. First of which, they claim that uh, the first reason to believe is that they've misplaced the context of this extension because they establish and assert that Amuda will automatically enter into a coalition with PH. The problem is a fewfold. Firstly, Parliament formed a week ago, last like uh, in November already, which means the coalition has already formed, of which Amuda was not part of it, but was also just the one who was only supportive of it. The second thing to note here is just to say, and didn't to notice here is that they actually fail analytically to explain why they're actually going to form a coalition independent of just being like we have similar ideals. The second thing as uh, can they make is they go compromise is less likely to occur in Muda than in PH. The first thing is that you take them at the best, the question you have to ask yourself is to what extent? Because both are left-wing parties, both support things like social spending, both support things like improving education and healthcare outcomes, both support things like being anti-corrupt. It is unclear the extent to which this is actually able to be able to affect politics in a meaningful way, which means the question you have to ask yourself is to what extent does Muda actually have PH, have leverage over PH in order to get action? And the thing here is they do not establish this. The reason why they don't are for two reasons. Firstly, we explain why Muda has one seat, PH was short of around 30 seats, which is why the influence relative in the coalition means PH is far more likely to listen to everyone else as opposed to just Muda because they're contributing less to holding the coalition and, uh, coalition together. And in the, importantly, I think it's to say, insofar as you do lose Muda because they don't like you and want to draw away, one seat isn't going to cripple a coalition. That happens when other parties with far more seats leave the coalition. That's why they don't have much leverage. The second thing here is that Muda in of itself doesn't have much leverage. For the very reason, it's a youth organization. They often do not have connection to donors. They often do not have connections to the establishment, which means they are least likely to be able to do things like mobilize and campaign for the policies you want to put forward and have any sway in the media, which means they're not actually that useful or a party to you. The question then you had to ask that as a politician, are you more likely to listen to someone within PH or outside PH? The thing is, it is obviously within for three reasons. Because firstly, you are already on time, which means you're broadly achieving the same goals. Secondly, you literally work with people within the party engine, so you know people to talk to, and you're far more likely to trust them because you interact on a very on daily basis, as opposed to being in a separate political party. And third thing to note here is that you are also internally valuable to someone within the party, because if you want to advance, if someone else wants to advance the kind of PH party ladder, they need your help to do so, which is why they're likely to form this connection and likely to acquiesce to your demands. And that is why you're far more likely to be influential than Muda, where of which you have like no impact on people's own internal uh, career progressions within the party. That is why I think CG's uh, extension about getting progressive policy doesn't really exist. It is at best marginal, but more so they never actually prove why Muda has sufficient leverage to actually generate the change it wanted to be able to influence PH in a positive way. Now focusing on the broad parts of this debate, what is best for career advancement? This is the most important question for a few reasons. The first of which they already explained that policy supported on both sides is a relatively marginal outcome because Muda has already acceded to following most of PH's policy demands. Secondly, the personal benefits to career advancement are significant. It looks like things like financial stability. It looks like things like promotions. It looks like having stable pay so you can support yourself. And no, it's just a concrete benefit which occurs when you have a seat in Parliament as opposed to a speculative benefit as to for how much influence you can get, which is why you ought to be uh, being way more significant. The third thing here is that uh, career advancement is critical because you can't let CJ get away with the assertion that, ah, you're going to be talented on both sides. You can get any outcome because you are able to, you know, be a cool debater and influence things. The problem is the parties in of itself have different organization which allow which better facilitates your capacity to actually climb ladder and to actually gain influence and this is where david's extension comes in relatively critically right because he explains within ph it has things like connections and things like resources to establish politicians he has things like for example uh, kinds of connections which allow you to uh, uh, to attract election funders. They have resources to invest in you. They have mentors to teach you how to politic and to do things like pre-election uh, coalition forming and all those things. These are resources which are only true for a party which is an incumbent that has been established for the past 30 or 40 years. That is not true for a party which was literally established in 2018. And that was the key difference in this way and why PH was always going to be better and always more facilitative towards someone who was talented, aspiring and wanted to climb the ladder. The second, and note this is a better explanation of 
of our oh, oh, argument about resource, but very soon we actually explain that it's just like mechanisms which help this individual advance their career. The second benefit we give to you is that we are able to wield political influence. Oh, oh, only explain that you help capture the youth vote, but they don't actually structurally explain why the youth actually matter more and why this individual is likely to have more leverage within PH. And I just say, David explains that firstly, the recent lowering of the voting age means there is a far more large youth base, but also secondly, the very specific characterization as to how youth voters are polarized means that often you want to capture people who are youth who are moderate, youth who are on the right, as opposed to only capturing the progressive votes, which means that you're far more better able to do that as a moderate party, as opposed to being on a far radical party. And the thing here is, like, CG trying to wash this out by being like, oh, we don't care about right wing youth. But the thing is, you probably do, right? Because there are a set of youth issues which affect all of them, irrespective of your political spectrum. Whether it is youth unemployment or whether it is a sense of a loss of national identity, you as a PH member can still compete on these grounds, which is able to attract those who are more on the right and are able to de-radicalize them and pull them into the party. And that is a unique benefit you bring to this party. But before that, a PRI from OG. Uh, even if you get votes for PH, your only incentive for them to have you is that you're a token for them that they could use as votes. You're not going to get to have to make those policies. You're have to going to compromise what's yeah, the change. We get money, we get stability, we get connections, which means that in the long term, we're far more likely to get the policies we want, not a harm in this debate. The second thing then in which CJ also responds is it's like, ah, even if you're in the party, you don't get a powerful seat. Like a seat is better than no seat. So like, I guess be comparative there. I think then responding to OG's claim, which is, which is to say, well, you have more influence in Muda because you are a fish in a small, uh, you're like a big fish in a small pond. The first thing to note is this is relatively unimportant in so far as the policy outcomes are relatively the same. Because if you raise benefits like being hurt or being comfortable, that is literally just like talking to a friend and talking to a community group as, act as opposed to actually making policy. Unimportant here. But the second thing to note here is that we explain why you are uniquely powerful as a youth in the PH. For the very reason we explain that firstly, the youth is polarized, which is why you can help attract votes. Uh, no. No, but they, not that. David explains why Muda is in of itself unlikely to gain power and this gets no response from CG. Because we explain that firstly, the youth is polarized. That secondly, there is low trust for Muda because they don't have an electoral history. The third thing is that because they're young, the view is incompetent and inconsistent. Their response is things get over, better over time. But we explain two additional structural reasons as to why Muda is likely to struggle. Because firstly, the first part of the system structurally disadvantages minor parties for the very reason that there is no preferential vote, which allows you to put your eggs in two baskets. The second thing to be here is that because they're more radical, you automatically lose people who are moderate and automatically lose those people on the right. This is just the way that the pathway into power for Muda is incredibly uh, hard to achieve. It is uncertain as to whether you can achieve it. You're better off being in a more established party to actually get the benefits that you want to get. These are the reasons as to why we wipe out OpBench because we explain the best pathway towards your own personal career is for you to be in PH, but also the best chance of you being to influence politics is to be a prominent member of PH. That is why we win this debate. Just one, two final metrics as to weigh in against OO. Firstly, you should weigh us against them because we have better depth of analysis, which is specifically tied to Malaysia as a country. The second thing here is that we have more concrete benefits about career advances, which is not contingent upon how much policy influence you actually get. We prove a solid thing. This is something no other team does in this debate. I thank the speaker and everyone for an excellent debate. I'd like to now invite all speakers to exit the room as myself and the judge deliberate, and we'll call you back later on once the verdict is ready. Uh, across the floor, shake hands, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for the round, everyone.